So my name's Kate Farhall. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at um, RMIT University, which is in Melbourne, Australia. And there I'm part of a, a group called the Centre for People, Organisation and Work, which is a bunch of really interesting people who do very varied things on the topic of work. Um, so my main research project uh, looks at intersections between the workplace and domestic and family violence, particularly in a non-metropolitan context in Australia. So my main site is um, a, a region in the southeast of Australia. Uh, and the kind of purpose of that is with a particular view to understanding how workplaces can best respond to domestic violence and what the kind of the role of the workplace is in this space. Um, but the current paper I'm going to present to you today is a little bit um, different. It takes a slightly different approach. It's something new I'm doing um, by examining public discourses around this intersection between work and family violence. Uh, and especially today, I'm going to talk about one particular aspect of that, which is the question of domestic violence leave. So this has been a really significant area of debate uh, within Australia over the past about two or so years. Um, and so talking about whether employers should be obliged to provide a specific leave category for domestic violence, so on top of annual leave, other forms of sick leave, personal leave, etc. Uh, so to analyse these kinds of public discourses, I used um, both some interview material from my primary research data, uh, alongside a whole bunch of documentary evidence, so including things like media articles, uh, publications from employer groups and unions, uh, and some relevant materials from uh, think tanks in Australia as well. Uh, so I used this quote uh, from one of my articles to kind of set the scene. So domestic violence is not a toy for workplace relations. So I want us to get in the zone. This is a serious discussion about work and we're not mucking around, all right? Uh, so often in my presentations, I like to lead with a quote. I try and keep you hooked, give you a flavor of the data before I go back and do the kind of setting up and framing business. Um, so I thought I might lead with this quote today which says, when we create a rule, the focus is removed from the real issue, the violence, and becomes a debate around workplace relations. So this was a quote I found on the website of the Council of Small Business Organisations Australia, which is an employer group in Australia. Um, and I'm not going to unpack this now, but you can kind of let it ruminate in the back of your mind while I go back and talk about a few other things, and then I'll, I'll come back and tell you what I think about this particular quote. Uh, I do want to kind of announce a few caveats here. This is a really recent project. I'm still working through the data. I don't feel super familiar with it uh, and still trying to understand the theoretical significance, the practical significance. Um, so bear with me as I work through it with you. But I'm really looking forward to if you have any thoughts, advice, ideas, literature, please do engage with me at the end of the session. I also know I'm standing between you and lunch, so I'll try and keep it moving. Okay, to do a little bit of framing work, I don't know if any of you came to the SASE conference in June in Kyoto. If you did and you happened to see my presentation, this is a bit of crossover, but um, new data, so bear with me. So one kind of key element of feminist theorizing on work has centered on the kind of arbitrariness of the discursive boundaries that we create between work, family, and community. So rather, feminists argue that instead of these domains being kind of separate and compartmentalized, they're actually mutually constitutive, they're interactive, they feed in and out of one another in multiple and complex ways. So we can't kind of isolate one from another and analyze it separately without reference to the others. And I think that's particularly relevant in the context that we're working in at this conference and in the CRIMP network, because when we talk about institutional experimentation for better work, we're often kind of already beginning to break down these arbitrary boundaries. We're talking about, when we talk about these fault lines of change that impact on work, we're often talking about external forces outside of the workplace, uh, such as climate change, things which might have an impact on employment. And when we talk at this conference and throughout the CRIMP network about better work, uh, we're often alluding to the ways in which workplaces can make lives better and communities better. So I think we're already breaking down those boundaries. So feminist analyses tend to bring these connections between these spheres and across these dimensions to the foreground. 
And they see workplaces as sites of uh, cultural production and reproduction. So workplaces aren't these gender neutral arenas where workers kind of leave their gender at the door, but rather they're really um, the gendered understandings that exist within workplaces and exist outside kind of um, emanate and permeate those boundaries. So feminists do this in particular because they've long argued that work and the kind of concept of the ideal worker are gendered male. So therefore, the kinds of interactions, relationships, and the complications between these different spheres actually tend to be more salient for women, and women might find them harder to navigate. So if you've got more uh, caring responsibilities, if you're more involved in social reproduction, those boundaries are already more kind of porous. So I wanted to go on a few little side points about feminist analysis here, because that's my background. I don't come from labor studies, HR, anything like that. Uh, I'm a feminist media scholar by training, which is hence why I gravitated towards this discourse analysis business. Um, but a few points about a feminist approach. Um, currently, a lot of the work that looks at domestic violence in the workplace uh, is quite quantitative in its approach a lot of, t a lot of the time, sorry, uh, and often doesn't involve a lot of theory, and particularly not a lot of feminist theory. So I'm kind of interested in opening up more structural questions, more feminist questions in this space. They're also often not particularly ideological in their approach. And applying a gendered lens to a problem uh, acknowledges that you're looking for something in particular. You're, you're kind of coming in with an ideological framing. And I think that's a useful thing to do. A second side note I wanted to note about feminist research uh, today is that, uh, and I know this will be applicable to lots of people in the room most likely who, who research challenging issues. Um, that this stuff can be really hard, and I think we don't acknowledge that in public spaces very often. So in my normal work, I'm talking to people uh, who, I'm interviewing people who work in domestic violence. They might be crisis workers, they might be um, counselors, they might be health workers. Um, and so we're talking about horrific things that are happening in society. And I actually interestingly thought this project would be some ways less emotionally taxing. Oh, I'm just reading some, some media articles and some documents and things. Um, but it's actually involved reading, for example, a lot of quite conservative newspapers that are often quite vitriolic, um, at times sexist, racist, um, some problematic opinion pieces, letters, um, and other kind of casually thoughtless pieces of, of uh, writing as well. And I think oftentimes we kind of privatize or minimize uh, the toll that this kind of research takes. So I just wanted to kind of open it up today and nod to anyone else in the audience who does difficult, challenging work and that, you know, sometimes we need to say that out loud. Okay, so I'm going to whip through uh, some of the background stuff because I want to get to the data and I know I've already talked for quite some time. Um, existing research on domestic violence and work uh, has certain limitations. I've already touched on that a bit. It's quite descriptive, it's often quite individualized, takes the workplace in isolation, etc. I won't dwell on that anymore, but feel free to ask questions later if you like. Okay, so why look at discourses? Why, why does this matter? Well, domestic violence, as we know, is quite a gendered phenomenon, both in terms of the drivers underlying it and also the kind of experiences and the practical outcomes of it. Of course, that's not to say that men are always perpetrators, women are always victims, that it doesn't occur in LGBTQI communities, etc. but there are gendered patterns involved. And why discourses? Well, if domestic violence is a gendered power relationship, power is often exercised through language. The way we talk about things actually contributes to the way our kind of material reality is structured, the way we talk about these issues impacts on how we might deal with them, essentially. And I um, went to a great panel yesterday on the creative industries where Amanda Coles was talking about uh, gender imbalance in, I think it was uh, the TV industry, potentially. And she just had a really simple way of talking about why these kinds of things matter. So she said, if stories are our social currency, how equitably is that wealth distrib distributed? And I think that kind of applies for public discourse as, as well. If public discourse is a, a part of our social currency, who has the power to say what, where, when that impacts? All right, so moving into my data. So um, some of my data comes from interviews I did uh, with people who work, whose job has something to do with domestic violence. So that might not be their primary role, but their work in some way intersects with that. 
So I had, um, I have 11 interviews so far, so I looked at those interview transcripts, and then I added a whole bunch of documents. Uh, so a total of 173 documents, they're all from the two year period from the 5th of September 2016 to the 5th of September this year. Uh, and that included 144 news articles from four daily Australian newspapers, uh, two national newspapers and two in my home state of Victoria. Uh, and then 15 employer documents, 11 union publications and three uh, materials from think tanks. And my kind of initial searches turned up around 2,000 documents and then I waded through them and I picked out everything uh, that where the kind of central focus was on the workplace and domestic violence. And then I used a feminist critical discourse analysis uh, to analyze the data. And I won't dwell on that now, but feel free to ask questions. So coming back to this uh, quote that I started out with. This comment was made essentially in an opinion piece on the web page of the Council of Small Business Organizations Australia. And it was tackling the question of whether all Australian businesses should be required to provide this domestic violence leave. So basically, COSBOA, as they're called, uh, was here arguing that creating a requirement for domestic violence leave actually draws focus away from tackling the violence itself, that it creates unnecessary complications, and that it, sent, um, in, it centers the discussion as a workplace one, which they obviously are suggesting it's not. They're suggesting it's something outside of the workplace. So these two issues are kind of being compartmentalized as separate from one another here. And to me, this quote highlights some of the key aspects of the debate that I'm really interested in. So firstly, the question of whether domestic violence is a workplace issue at all. So coming back to that issue I highlighted early on about those intersections between work and house and community and whether we can or should kind of separate these out. The second question it highlights is a question of the kind of public-private divide. So if we understand domestic violence to be external and unrelated to the workplace, are we kind of reinforcing or re reifying that public-private divide, which a lot of feminists have so heavily critiqued as really detrimental and problematic for women? Thirdly, uh, another issue that I'm kind of going to go through in the data that comes up here is the kind of trivializing of workplace provisions for domestic violence support. So by saying this is not a workplace issue, and also depending on the language we might use to make that kind of statement, are we also minimizing the importance of those connections between the different spheres, but also minimizing potentially the importance of domestic violence altogether? So I want to unpack these further in the rest of my presentation, uh, focusing on this discussion about domestic violence leave in Australia. And I only have a few minutes left, so I'll try and be quick. Okay, so what I found in my data was that on the one hand, uh, the workplace and the household were kind of kept, kept separate in this discourse by those who were opposed to providing domestic violence leave. And this kind of manifested through what I kind of understood as a bit of an outdated allegiance or adherence to this idea of the public-private sphere uh, split. So basically, a lot of kind of employer groups uh, who were anti-domestic violence leave were kind of invoking this separation and this question of a private issue and domestic violence as being something that is in the home and therefore irrelevant to the workplace. So this is, um, this is an example of how that kind of manifested in the data. So again, the Council of Small Business Organizations uh, saying domestic violence is a private issue in many ways and now the management of it has become a public issue through demands for domestic violence leave. So that's a really clear kind of example of the way that uh, business groups were kind of trying to push, push domestic violence back into the private sphere. But what I found was interesting was that on the other hand, a focus on the workplace specifically and kind of in isolation could also be a bit of a tactical or a strategic choice um, by those who were proponents of domestic violence leave. So sometimes uh, there was a focus on the workplace exclusively um, because this enabled uh, particularly unions who are, are pushing for this leave category uh, to feel they might have a better chance of engaging with employers and of pushing the issue forward. So this strategic approach was particularly strongly articulated in an interview I did with a woman who works for one of the kind of peak bodies for unions in my home state of Victoria. She's the head of their gender and diversity union uh, and was quite involved with this push for domestic violence leave. So her perspective was uh, that if it's presented as an industrial OH&S, so occupational health and safety issue, 
that's the best way to get it through to workplaces. So she was kind of saying, workplaces and even many unions may or may not listen if this is presented as a moral issue, but if you present it as a workplace issue and particularly a question of health and safety, employers and unions are more likely to sit up and listen. So I found it really interesting that kind of both sides of this debate attempted to compartmentalise home and work, but for quite different reasons. What was also interesting about this kind of compartmentalisation of the workplace was that I found it also led to an invisibilisation of the reality of domestic violence. Because if you're kind of focusing on the workplace alone and in isolation, you're not really talking about what is the violence, what's happening, etc. So uh, not only did I find kind of minimal examples in my data where, where work and home were kind of spoken of in conjunction or in relation to one another, there were also really minimal examples where a broader issue of domestic violence, a broader picture of the issue of domestic violence was kind of taken. So I coded all the documents that I uh, analysed, uh, except the interview transcripts, because they, they were broader, um, for instances where the reality of domestic violence could be seen. So this could be, for example, a first-hand account of the experience of domestic violence, uh, talking about the kind of specific um, physical or psychological or practical impacts of domestic violence, perhaps talking about statistics to give a sense of the extent of domestic violence, um, or using examples or case studies to kind of make a point. So I was looking for things that, that kind of opened up, what are we talking about when we're talking about domestic violence? And I found of the 173 documents that I looked at, only 18 actually acknowledged that reality of violence, which I found quite interesting. The rest were very much focused on workplaces and kept it very, um, kind of objective. But to me, I found that uh, this kind of further reifies those boundaries, right? Because you're maintaining a focus on work and the workplace, and you're not even acknowledging the reality of the issue that you're talking about. But also, I'd argue that this means the kind of humanity of the situation is removed. Um, so for example, Questions of intersectionality don't come into this discussion at all because you're not talking about who's at risk, why are they at risk, you know, what, what's the picture um, kind of in the public sphere. Um, I was going to go off on a tangent about intersectionality, but I'll leave that. I'm a bit out of time. Uh, and lastly, the last kind of bit of the data I wanted to touch upon before I wrap up really quickly um, is that alongside this kind of repudiation of the lived experiences of domestic violence, there was also quite a strong discourse, uh, particularly from more conservative quarters, the more conservative documents I was looking at, which really trivialised the question of workplace responses to domestic violence. And by extension, sometimes that meant they trivialised domestic violence itself. Uh, so an example of that is from a journalist in the Australian newspaper, which is quite a conservative newspaper um, in Australia who said, uh, and sorry, a, a little cultural, I'm not sure if you have the word sicky in your countries. In Australia, that means you're taking a sick day, but you're not actually sick. So you're kind of rotting the system, essentially. Um, so this journalist wrote, how long before the phrase, I'm thinking of chucking a divvy, like a domestic violence sicky, tomorrow becomes common in our vernacular. Perhaps paid domestic violence leave is not so much a reflection of a sick society where familial violence is rampant, but a symptom of a system where cashed up unions with little real work to do have scraped the bottom of the barrel and found something to agitate for to keep themselves publicly relevant. So that's uh, quite something. Um, and I would argue, and I'm sure many of you agree, Trivialising domestic violence um, or the interconnections between domestic violence and work is problematic in and of itself. But I'd also suggest that this trivialising language further kind of entrenches that separation between work and home by playing down the significance between the two. All right, I know I'm pretty much out of time, so I will just uh, head to some final thoughts. So I hope through this presentation, one, you've stayed awake at the end of a long conference, but also that I've begun to show how I think the issue of domestic violence in the workplace kind of acutely challenges the artificial boundaries that we might create between work and home and community and forces us to rethink our understanding of the interrelationships between them. Now, when I was kind of finalising this presentation, I went back and looked at my abstract 
and looked at what I was supposed to be talking about, which is always very dangerous. But there were three things that I kind of promised to do, so I'll try and wrap them up really quickly. Uh, so firstly, to identify the kind of discursive contours of the debate within Australia around this issue, with a particular focus on that question of public and private. So as I said, this kind of came through both in a way that reinforces gendered notions, but also is used strategically. Secondly, I claimed I'd talk about uh, what kinds of opportunities and challenges arise from this de debate, both practically and theoretically. And thirdly, I said I'd talk about what this means and what these kinds of debates mean for groups like unions, policymakers, um, workplaces, etc., and how we might kind of effectively navigate workplace responses to domestic violence. And I don't really have the answers to this, um, but I think that questions of gender equality are kind of structural questions that are sewn into the fabric of societies and they require coordinated approaches. But what I think is interesting here is whether you meet kind of, so if you're pro-domestic violence leave, do you meet opponents on their terms? Um, do you use that strategic approach to try and talk to them about the issues that you know, are salient to them? Uh, or does that kind of more limited, perhaps strategic engagement lead to other problems down the line that maybe we haven't foreseen? And I'll leave it there. Thank, Thank you. you very much.